first of all, I want to thank you all for uh, coming to this uh, first of the year, first of the academic year, uh, distinguished leader lecture uh, event, uh, fireside chat with uh, Matthew Putman, uh, who's the co-founder and CEO of uh, Nanotronics. Um, so this uh, particular uh, fireside chat is uh, sponsored, uh, as are all of our principal fireside chats, by uh, Southern Glazers Wine and Spirits. Uh, the only problem is that uh, you can't have any until it's over. Um, but, you know, there may, and then you have to show an ID card as well. Um, but uh, not, that's not applicable to you guys up front. Um, but thank you very much to all of our students, especially for uh, coming out for this event, because uh, Nanotronics is really truly one of the uh, uh, most important leading edge companies in the arena of manufacturing in the US. I think it's the first time we've really talked about manufacturing in this lecture series. Uh, and of course, it's uh, critical uh, from a national security point of view as well as a uh, commercial point of view for the US to be strong in manufacturing and to uh, have uh, its supply chains uh, as uh, independent as possible. So in addition to uh, Matthew, who's going to be in the center on the stage, I'm um, also going to be joined by uh, Professor Robert Plant. Uh, Robert is the uh, uh, business technology department chair here at uh, Miami Herbert Business School. Um, he's been here for 35 years uh, and so um, is the voice of continuity. Um, and uh, although, as you'll find out in a moment, he supports the wrong British soccer team, um, nevertheless, uh, you know, if you can stomach having two British accents on stage at once, uh, we're going to have him up here uh, with Matthew as the antidote um, with uh, his uh, New York, uh, is it New York? Is it fair to say New York accent? Uh, Ohio. Ohio originally, okay. Is there anyone here from Ohio? All right, so we have, oh, all right, we have some Ohio people here. Good, good. All right, so let's get underway. Uh, why don't you two guys come up and we'll do about 30 minutes uh, Q&A, but uh, think of your questions, especially all of you students here, because we're gonna have plenty of time for student Q&A uh, after the talk. So let's get underway. All right. So I'm, I'm going I'm to kick it off, uh, and uh, I'm just going to ask a very simple leading question, Matthew, which is, uh, what is nanotronics? Uh, what does the name mean, and what do you do? Well, the name is sort of nano for nanotechnology, which was my interest and in what my studies were in, and electronics, electronics I guess, um, kind of creates a new way of thinking about uh, the nano scale. Um, which we're, we can talk about it more. But nanotronics, we started 12 years ago. Um, I grew up in a factory environment. My father had a company that uh, I ended up running that put the first computers on the factory floors, PCs, in 1982. So I've been working since I was eight years old on factory automation, um, working on, you know, trying to make manufacturing different than it has been for the last 100 years, where there hasn't been a great deal of change. Uh, I went to work in academia then for a few years and wanted to get out of the lab where we were doing some, I think, really exciting work but wasn't making its way into industry. And with this background in industry, I, I wanted to change that. And we started by this phrase, to build a future, you need to see it. So if we were going to measure things on the nanoscale, if we were going to look at the future of manufacturing, imagine everything that is in every bit of electronics that you have, semiconductors, um, nanofillers, these are all on a scale that you can't see. You can't even see with normal microscope. So we started by doing imaging and looking at those things in order to see where there were flaws in the manufacturing process, where, how you could design things with new features. And then we were lucky that artificial intelligence came along. And different types of machine learning techniques that we were seeing in our everyday life, and, you know, you start to see it with things like the Amazon, the Alexa, and the Siri. And you started to see gaming engines, um, for, for things like the, being the world's expert in go, uh, and trying to apply those lessons to factory 
itself and creating this kind of cybernetic organism of a factory as an intelligent being. So now we work with semiconductor companies, we work with from semiconductors to genomics companies, to tire companies, uh, to chemical companies, really in almost every industry. Uh, and what what, what, what do you actually do that adds value? Is this a, is this a cost-cutting play? Is it a productivity play? Uh, is it a facilitating innovation play? What, what, what are we doing when we are working with a semiconductor company? Well, the goal is, and this is also a nanotechnology dream, is to make things that are as high-tech as possible. So that when you think about the so with very little ways to be perfect yields and can lead to the next level of innovation. So it's, I wouldn't say it's directly cost cutting, but of course it leads to a codification that is cost cutting in the end. Um, the idea is to further technology and do something that really matters in the world. What, what, what do you think are the two or three most important recent innovations in manufacturing? I think that, um, well, I, I think that gene editing is a really big one. So we saw this with the mRNA vaccines. So this is something that is, of course, true for, for any of us that received any of either the Moderna, the Pfizer that vaccine, some of the others. I think this was a major deal. And what we will see in the future from gene editing is huge. I think that um, generally the way that we manipulate atoms for the creation of electronics, we're moving from the manufacturing of semiconductors, which is the most complex process in biology, manufacturing look pretty easy by comparison to what goes on in the semiconductor fab. Um, I think that we're moving to the next generation of this, and I think that we need to, if, if, if we're going to progress in society. I think there's definitely advanced the DNA there as well. Um, and I, I think that biotech as a whole is starting to evolve in a different way. Um. Just one follow-up question. Miami Herbert is uh, quite well known for its commitment to uh, sustainable business. Uh, so with respect to uh, emissions and uh, climate challenges, is there anything that you are doing that bears on that issue? Well, absolutely everything does. So if you're making things as precisely as possible, you have as little waste as possible. I think it's something like um, a quarter of all emissions are caused by manufacturing and processing. So if more in other places in the world. Um, so the more precisely you make things, the less emissions you have, and it makes a very large difference. It's, it's uh, something that I think used to be associated a lot with pollution and problems, but it still is a major issue. So wherever we can make manufacturing better, by the use of artificial intelligence or imaging or other types of automation, the better the environment will be. All right, great. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to uh, Professor Plant for uh, uh, a little bit of a deep drill into uh, uh, the business technology aspects of this. Oh, thank you, Dean. This is a really exciting moment over technology. Uh, leader from manufacturing with us is a truly great thing. And uh, I'm very interested in, in how you not just um, look at the verification aspects of the chip, of the fabrication process, but I think the students would be very interested too in how you close the loop with manufacturers so you're not just at the receiving end of the fabrication process. Do you go back and help them adjust the manufacturing process, or how does that work? Yes, so this is where it becomes really exciting. So when we started, the goal was to do measurements, give uh, feedback to human engineers and scientists so that they could change their process and improve it. And you know, we did it in a we think novel ways, but others were doing this. This is the way manufacturing generally works, is you have some type of quality assurance or some, you know, some type of process control that helps feed this system. Now with artificial intelligence, it's the opposite. Now this is, I, I think this is really new to people, is that now we have a chance for the human to ask the question of the AI and the AI to make the change. So it's no longer a human that it is being informed by the AI, but the AI that is being informed by the question that the humans ask. This is a completely different way of thinking, and it's true in other places other than, you know, we see it even in our maps. We see it in, um, there's a famous uh, computer program called GPT-3 uh, that can generate text, not just retrieve text, so it has to do with what questions you've asked of it, that it actually is able to generate something from it. We use a lot of those same methods for generating answers and having 
the AI actually run a factory? So I think that this is uh, this uh, this the notion that people have in their minds maybe that humans will build chips and design chips. And I mean, I think that that actually stopped happening in the 80s and 90s, and as people started to automate the process. And, and so now today, are you building chips that are, or giving people the feedback for chips that are able to be less complex, more reliable, cheaper, and therefore can be put into new devices? Well, yes, uh, we, we're not focused on design per se, we're focused on process design. So when I say that humans are asking the questions, what we want to leave humans room for is to have KPIs. So the things that they want, they're asking the machine to do. So it, it's, not, it's not that you're just saying design is a chip. It's saying we want to have this particular yield, we want this efficiency, we want this type of electric, electrical properties. When this is done, the AI can run with it. And that, that's what hasn't been going on since the 80s. There are brilliant chip designers out there, but we have reached a level where you're dealing with such tiny things, with such complexity, that only an AI can really run with it. And if the chips are so expensive to manufacture and deliver the ratings and errors, then those will be able to place them in to so return the bad. So do you, and, and you as a company, or a learning company too, and you're, you're chasing down the Moore's law itself as we move to three nanometer chips, and, and, and that must be a challenge for you and your technology. How do you, how do you face that? How do you look at that? Well, I have, I have strong opinions about Moore's Law. It's, it's Moore's Law, you know, I, I guess everybody's familiar with Moore's Law, this, um, you know, doubling of, of, of a speed and efficiency while halving of the price. Um, it's generally been done using the same process, basically, for the last 60 years. Um, it's done on silicon, it's two-dimensional. Um, and so they move to nano, you know, they're moving down to five, down to three nanometer nodes for doing this. And it's generally thought that this is how you maintain Moore's Law. Now, we're reaching the boundaries of what physics is possible in physics by using this process, not what's the boundary of physics in general. So where it's exciting to keep up is by going to 3D materials, to doing something with uh, something called chiplets, which is how you connect different uh, types of chips together in order to keep that kind of progress going. Now, that's not who everybody looks at. So, you know, whether by 2029 or whenever this end comes, I would say we should consider the end of Moore's Law the way it currently is to already be over. Oh, that's fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, just, I was very interested, too, about the deployment of the general question on chips in, in devices that most of us in the room have, like Alexa or devices in and as the Internet of Things uh, develops, how do you see the Internet of Things changing in the factory of the future? Is that something you think is going to happen soon, or is there a time lag until well, these chips are Well, we're doing it already. Um, now, I wouldn't call it the Internet of Things in some ways. It's, I don't know if you say the Internet or something. We, we believe in using edge computing. Um, you know, for security reasons, the constant communication with the cloud can be an issue. So what we want is all sensors and controllers in a factory to speak to each other, but speak to it within that factory itself, to be learning as the process goes on. So the, this organism of a factory exists outside of the rest of the world even. Now, we, we use all that information for something we call transfer learning, so that you know, we get smarter from it. It can help train better neural nets, and each factory gets better and better. But at any given time, it's not so much the internet of things, but that what's going on actually inside that factory. Do you see American uh, factories becoming more competitive uh, during this next period because of the, the, the reassertion of technology to come home to manufacturing here? Do you think the factories are going to reinvent this process or be deploying the decades? I hope so. Uh, I don't. I, I can't say that I see the United States as being leaders right now, to be honest. Um, I don't think that that's inevitable. I think that there's incredible opportunity, and when you talk about the types of things, these kind of future tech that we're talking about right now, things that are exactly present that haven't been done five years ago, you know, we have a chance to lead. As of now, we're not a manufacturing nation in the same way we used to be. Um, so I think there's a big challenge. The, the latency on the chip manufacturing and coming out of Taiwan and Asia is perhaps giving people pause for thoughts, and, and, and it's also giving people a pause in the factory design. So if you're 
Ford or GM, maybe this has given you that window opportunity to take breath, re reassess where the factory is going to be as they deploy electronic vehicles and uh, sell them to make self driving vehicles. Right, or an opportunity for new companies to come along. Yes. Uh, you know, it's really hard to break the inertia of large business and the way people have been doing things yes. for many Tesla's, years. Uh, yeah. Uh, blanks, blanks. yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, talking about uh, Tesla, Tesla's obviously uh, principally manufacturing, uh, very largely manufacturing in China. Uh, so, can you talk a little bit about how you see the evolution of manufacturing in China? And are there companies that are remotely close to what you're doing that are trying to uh, come on screen uh, or otherwise learn what you're up to? No, remember, we're the enablers of others, so everybody's a partner, our customer, of ours. We're not, you know, it's not, we don't sit around and worry about competition from other companies like ourselves. Uh, but as far as China, it's, it really, I stressed this before, it's, we really are behind China and Taiwan in this space right now. We don't manufacture in the same way that we used to as a country. So, you know, the, the competition is stiff. If we think of it as competition, when I say that I don't think about competition in nanotronics, I also don't really think of competition as a nation in that way. I want to start to exchange ideas with other places again and start to trade again. But for the moment, we have to start building in order to have anything to be able to, do, to, to trade ideas with. The uh, revitalization then of the uh, U.S. manufacturing, uh, does Washington call you for import? From, from time to time, I not know. <laughs> no, uh, no, I, I, they told me about quantum computing and nanotechnology part of it. So very specific manufacturing that they realize um, China has a, a lead on in some ways, or at least is pretty much on the same footing as us, where we'd say we still have a good shot. So I, I speak uh, to Washington on those uh, points quite a bit. Um, you know, but certainly the large manufacturing companies are, are spending plenty of time allowing me more than I am. Are um, there two or three specific things that the U.S. should be doing uh, to facilitate the return of manufacturing where it's not the innovation? Yes, in investing in small fabs. So fabs are, by the way, the way that there are factories for making semiconductors. So it's fabs or factories in general. There's, there's a thought that when you open a fab, you spend $20 billion. So the new Intel fab is $20 billion in Ohio. State. Um, I mean, this is, this is um, to me, not a, a recipe for success if we're only building things that cost $20 billion. Um, they're investing in small um, fabs that can be brought up to speed very quickly with new materials that bring you know, sort of less risk and are closer to the customers. Right. I think it's really important. Okay. I, I, I think just like to ask one last question. So now, well, how much have you seen the advent of companies like Plastic Logic? Who came out of the UK? Why, why was that catalyst there? Uh, after I said British question, um, why was that catalyst so strong when they came through that market in, in the States? We haven't really seen an AMD or a Zilog or anybody come through. You know, I don't know the answer to that. Do you think it's the investment in a market that we can see is that the catalyst? No, no, no I, I, don't think, I don't think, the, no. For us, I'm plenty happy that Intel's opening a facility in Ohio, so far, far be it from me to turn down a customer in Ohio. <laughs> However, it, 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 I don't know why other countries do what they do in, in, in a way, but you're right that, that we were a bit behind. Yeah, the uh, A model out of the UK came out is out of Cambridge Research, and uh, it's really a software company that designs chips and uh, it's basically more about software and things, not for some interesting times. But it's, it's true in a bit. Let, let me ask you, you know, a little bit about things that are not nanotechnology related for a moment, right? So how, how many employees do you have and um, can engineers work remotely in your company? Well, I guess now we have about 300 people um, and, you know, agents around the world as well. Uh, and we do not work remotely. Uh, we never worked remotely even throughout COVID. Uh, I, I feel it's really important to be near the machine 
So while we've been talking a lot about software and what we do in software, and you could consider us an AI software company in some ways, we also build this inspection equipment. So being around our own equipment and also being reminded that our customers build things is really important to us. Uh, so we, we really do like to stay close to the product and close to each other. And we, I, I personally feel that collaboration is important still. Uh, I think that it's a mistake to think that we should all be working remotely no matter what area of tech you work in. Um, you you co-founded uh, the company with your father. Yeah. So is he still involved? And how do you work things out when you have a difference of opinion? <laughs> well, we've been working together for many, many years, and he is still involved. My father is a great inventor. Um, I, you know, he, we have you know, about 300 patents, and I would say over half of them uh, he was the primary uh, inventor on. Uh, he's, so he is much more involved with inventing than he is with any managerial role at the company, but he's, I think, a great inspiration to a lot of us. And we get along great, and it's been a great honor to be able to work with him for this many years. What, what's it like to have Peter Thiel as a board member? That's wonderful as well. So Peter doesn't have a manufacturing background. Uh, and he will always say this, you know, that, well, you know, I'm, I'm, he'll have a conversation and say, well, I'm not sure if nanotechnology and manufacturing, if this applies, but he'll talk about PayPal or Facebook or Palantir, the companies that he has been deeply involved with, and it almost always bridges the ideas in such a way that I think really inspire, inspiring to me. I think all of our investors, a lot of our investors, a lot of our advisors are this way. It doesn't need to be the exact experience in this arena. We can find manufacturing experts, and sometimes they're stuck in their ways. Uh, Peter is extremely open and also really extremely clever at bridging these concepts. Uh, we're going to open it up to uh, questions uh, shortly, so please, uh, please be prepared to uh, ask a question of uh, Matthew. And, uh, you know, it's been a long time since I was sitting here um, sharing one of these sessions, but some of you will remember that my definition of a question is a single sentence that ends with a question mark. Uh, so, you know, please bear that in mind as you uh, frame your thought, uh, not your thoughts, but your thought, uh, to ask a good pithy question of Matthew. Um, so let, let me just ask uh, you um, about our on behalf of our students, if I may. So thanks to uh, Professor Plant and his colleagues in business technology, uh, we have uh, quite a significant number of students here who are uh, majoring as undergraduates in that subject area. And in addition, we have uh, uh, a large number of graduate programs, uh, which include our well-known MS in business analytics as well. Um, so. If you, if, you were, if, if you had a son or a daughter who was graduating from a business school undergraduate program uh, in 2023, what would you advise them to make sure they didn't leave their university without studying something about uh, in the next uh, year? Yeah, I, I think that there are two ways I would answer this. First of all, I think we've had about 100 years or so of hyper-specialization, and that was necessary for getting to the technological age that we live in now. I think with AI, uh, we're at a time where g being a generalist is more important now than it used to be. For this reason that I said, if we're now asking of our machines questions, and that questioning is Im as important as being able to do the calculations and the answering. So I, I would say that the, being a generalist is most important in a way that it probably wasn't even 10 years ago. Uh, if there is one thing to study, I, I really think that study, learning the basis, basics of what machine learning is, is so critical because it's a part of all of our lives in areas we don't even realize. We all know that we're being a advertised to all the time. Um, this is, I, I think, can be a problem that the greatest of minds has gone into uh, advertising to us. Or, but uh, it, the more we learn about it, the more that we learn the way that we are being manipulated, but we also learn the more ways that we can do good. So I'm going to take, I'm going to take issue with that as a veteran marketing professor. Oh, I'm sorry. And let, let you know that for the first 20 years of my marketing career as, a, as an instructor, 
Uh, I received tremendous amount of criticism, as did all marketing people, for the amount of waste that was involved in marketing. Famously captured in the line, half my advertising is wasted, I just don't know which half. We as, mar we as marketers then invested a tremendous amount of work in becoming good analytic folks and capable of more precisely targeting our marketing expenditures against the audience that uh, might be responsive to the uh, uh, message and therefore improved our productivity. And now we're accused of, manipu of manipulation and invading privacy. So which way do you want it? I'm being provocative, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, I'd rather the greatest minds not be doing something that I don't know what is going on behind my back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, there, were, there's great, there was great marketing. I mean, I, there's great advertisement. There's things I enjoy. I, I like being targeted, but I don't, I love being targeted if it helps me with something. But I don't like the mystery that you don't even know when something is a target. You don't even know when you are a target. And, um, you know, I, I think that it can be done right, but I don't think that our large corporations are necessarily doing it right now. And I would love some of the minds that are going into it to continue to work in marketing, of course. <laughs> of course. But at the same time, some of them going into building things would be nice, too. All right. You've been very gracious in your response. Thank you. Um, so let, let's open it up to a few questions. So who, who's got a question to start with? Uh, let's see if we can get two or three in a row, and then we'll uh, have Matthew respond to several at once. That'll be more uh, efficient. Yeah, so uh, I see one. Uh, the, gentleman with the orange t-shirt. I see the gentleman with, uh, yeah, there are three there. So we'll come to you, sir, third, and we'll do the uh, two behind you first. And uh, just keep the question short, if you could. Thank you. Go ahead. Was that accelerator? One. Accelerators, okay. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was one more behind you. Okay, um, so accelerators, I would have said that it is extremely hard to get them right, but some have gotten them right. Um, you know, certainly the most famous being Y Combinator. Being, you know, I, I have a friend that has a quantum computing company that went public out of there. We have friends that have worked in AI that have come out of there. And so I think a lot of accelerators are trying to follow that model, and if they do, we'll be successful. But I think it's hard to get it right. Uh, the second question. Oh, what, what risks? Oh, yeah, I guess I'm blocking it out. Um, no, you know, so when we started the company, I was still, uh, I was a professor at Columbia, and uh, I, you know, I was talking about this idea of making a super resolution microscope that would work for nanotechnology, and I made the mistake of talking to the wrong person at a party, not knowing that they actually were in the field. And uh, they said, well, this is, this is really what we're needed for a type of semiconductor called a uh, wide band gap material. So this is what LEDs are made out of. This is what some high power, uh, uh, power efficient materials. And he said, this sounds like something perfect for us. And I said, OK, then you know, you're, would you be willing to buy one? And so uh, they said yes very quickly. Um, the, so I knew there was a market need, but I never built it. Um, so this was me taking an order before I'd ever built anything. I knew it was within the realm of physics that it could be built, but I hadn't done it. So it was a race to get out there and do it. Um, that was a huge risk. I'm glad we took it, but it was very scary along the way. Now that's just one of many. There's risks every day like this that I think, you know, if, if you make the wrong move, could put the company at risk, um, could put the client at risk, but without taking them, we don't go anywhere. Um, what's, the, what's next for quantum computing? 
Um, so quantum computing is still one of these things that isn't quite there yet. Um, I'm really passionate about it, and we work with most of the companies that are in the space. I think in quantum communications, there's a lot that is going on right now, and I think it's, it's working very well. Where I want it to go is for a synthesis of new materials, uh, for use of fertilizers. I want it to go, just like with most of the things I do, to go for things other than military applications. All right, so let, let, let's take uh, three more if we can. Come on, guys. All right, we've got a couple at the front, let, but let, let's see if we've got some more students who would like to uh, ask a question. Yeah, so we have uh, one, one there. Let, let's just hold on a minute. Let's just see if we can get uh, a couple more of you to uh, put up a question. Yes, sir, you've got second one. Three, you have three, Caitlin? Okay, good, go for it. Yeah, I'll d <laughs> so ev everything in healthcare for the first time is nanotech, and I wouldn't have said that before. If you looked at the way pharmaceutical companies worked in the past, it was really kind of mixing stuff up and seeing how it turned out and going through a bunch of uh, trials uh, in order to get this done. Now we're actually editing genes. We're actually create, creating lipids, and we're creating you know, from scratch. We're, so it's become all nanotechnology. Um, and in some cases, synthetic nanotechnology. Um, we work with a company that's creating synthetic peptides, for instance, for targeting of cells uh, that can be worked, used for you know, almost any application. So in, in medicine, it is becoming all nanotechnology now, and that's extremely exciting for me to see. Uh, I draw inspiration. Luckily, I'm surrounded by a lot of extremely smart people. Um, I spoke a little bit about my father and about Peter Thiel, but I also, uh, I have the founder of nanotechnology, Eric Drexler, is an advisor and consultant for us. So the guy who inspired me when I read his book in 1986 uh, is actually a, a collaborator now. So I tend to find people that inspire me and, and drag them into the business in some ways. So I'm, I'm really lucky for that, but I draw inspiration from a lot of places. Um, from, from great musicians, anybody that excels in, in, in any field that they work in. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so we are, we are funny for a tech company and who we hire, and this is why business students should certainly apply for any role at uh, Nanotronics. Our chief operating officer was a photographer. Um, our creative director was a very famous uh, uh, designer of clothes. Uh, we have people from many different fields. Um, I have a background in music. Um, so we see potential in, in people that are creative from any area. Now there are these technical jobs, like actually writing AI algorithms, um, you really need to be a mathematician. It's extremely hard right now. Um, so those jobs are hard to, you know, th those are hard to fill in some ways, and there's a lot of competition for those. But in a, in a modern technology company that's looking to break new ground that we hope we're doing, all of these uh, different backgrounds are of use to us. You know, you mentioned uh, music, and uh, uh, I think you're a pretty accomplished jazz musician. So can, can you say a few words about how jazz improvisation relates to the creative process that you yourself use in the business? Sure, I, I, you know, I don't know how accomplished I am, but I do play jazz piano. And I think of it, like when, I, when I'm home practicing or something, it's like being in the lab, and when you're out on stage improvising, I play jazz, improv almost completely improvised music. 
And it's very much like going from experiment to production. And you're playing off of each other in a way that I think of when you're doing a science experiment. The best science, you're happiest when the outcome is not what you set out to achieve. It's when there's surprises. The same thing is true when you're playing music. When you're playing jazz, you want something to happen that is beautiful and surprising and transcendent. And that's the moments that are the best. And the same thing is true in science, and the same thing is true in business, I think. OK, gentlemen uh, at the front, I think these are some of your uh, fiercest and toughest uh, investor critics. Is that right? Or uh, who, who, do we, who, who do we have here? Is there anyone who's off limits to ask a question uh, no, that I, I shouldn't guess, call I on? All right, OK, so. great. All right, so we've got some uh, guys at the front who are going to ask some questions. Uh, go for it. Uh, a third one behind you. Okay, we'll take two. Uh, so we try to make a cool place to work, for one thing, but we try to show people what they have made. So you can, when you work at a large company, often um, you're you're a, you're doing something kind of small with within something. Even if it's something big, you don't get to see out in the world your work alone. Uh, every day, somebody that's at Nanotronics gets to see what their where their work contributes. So it's immediately, you know, getting you know talking to other people, and that from interns to you know PhD scientists, they all have this sense that their work is being seen, and that the customers see their work on a regular basis. Uh, that's that's the only way we can we we can compete is to make this exciting and and make people proud of the work that they're doing show people that they should be proud of the work they're doing um, onshoring I think people are scared I think that right now is a really scary time uh, I, I think that that's where we we have to come in and say they have tools that never existed before and that's what AI is is a new type of tool that allows for onshoring to be possible when you know 10, 10 or 15 years ago I think we'd be in a much more desperate situation than we are even now with all of the geopolitical issues, um, all the economic issues that we're dealing with right now. It's just a final question. I, I was very struck by your view on machine learning because we, we discuss it a lot in the department and in the school. And um, I think we're reaching a point where, not that we're going into Skynet, but I, I am concerned personally in the, about the ethical dynamics and where this will go. Uh, we see, and I talk to my students, it's very hard for them because they're so young very often to see the, the leaps that, and how long it takes. So we do 25 year increments on robotics, for instance, and now we see Boston Dynamics with their robots, and that, that's a 25, 30 year leap. So how do you think uh, the executives, in the, the future executives in the audience, such as our students, should consider the ethical dynamic of uh, machine learning and AI as they chart their paths and lead the future of uh, corporate America. Yeah, besides being aware of, beware of marketers, there, the longer term, um, uh, it, it is, you know, I, I, I seem like a broken record a little bit about this humans asking questions of our machines, but we're, we're going to have a kind of responsibility that we never had before to be able to phrase our questions correctly to machines. That sounds like a strange thing to say, but an, uh, an AI is there to optimize what a human wants. And if we ask it to optimize something that is dangerous to society, it will optimize for that, or eventually. And, th and yes, right, we, right. We, we, we can see, you can imagine this in autonomous vehicles, you can imagine this in a number of areas. It, it is all the more important to be philosophers all the time in a way that it wasn't before. Uh, we, we, are now the, we are now the philosophers while our machines are the ones that are doing the heavy lifting in a way that it's never been done before. 
So everything is ethics all the time. So ju just a couple of final questions from me, but if uh, there are any more in the audience, we'll definitely take them. Um, just in, in terms of um, life-work balance, um, are you consumed 24-7, uh, 365 days a year by this? Do you have a family? How do you deal with uh, those kind of considerations? Yeah, it's super hard to be honest. You know, it, it, is, it, is, all, it is consuming. Uh, I am lucky that if I look at what we're doing, it touches about everything that goes on in the world. You know, I, have, I get the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal every morning, and I sit with my 11-year-old and look ab ab above the fold, and we look at biases and see who, you know, what are the differences in the view of the same topic being covered by different news organizations. Um, then we look at Twitter feeds and all of this as well. But almost always, there's something that relates to what we do, whether we, you know, we do stuff with cybersecurity. Um, we, you know, we do stuff that, were, that was pandemic related. We do stuff that's, uh, you know, related to supply chain issues. So I can have these discussions uh, with my family and still be consumed by the business, and I'm lucky for that. But it is really hard to be a founder and CEO of a company and not be fully consumed by this. It's something big and it feels like a huge responsibility, not just to our teams, which I do feel a lot of responsibility for, but for all of our customers and, you know, and our investors. So it, it, it is a huge responsibility. Uh, and 25 years from now, you'll still be the CEO of Nanotronics. Well, if they'll, if they'll have me. <laughs> Some people are serial entrepreneurs, but you're not one of those, right? Well, you know, I've d done a lot of other business endeavors, but this, I really think that this does encompass what I want to do. So if Nanotronics is to go public, I still would like to be the CEO of it. Again, if, 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 if I'm the best person to be the CEO, and there's no telling, but I would like to continue to be. I also invest in other companies, involved with other tech companies that I believe in as well. What do you think of Miami as a potential tech hub? Well, it seems, it seems really happening right now. Like, you know, I, I, I can't believe all that's happened and the people that I know that are here now. Um, and, you know, a tech hub is built around the people that are there. Uh, you know, it's a, it, it, climate doesn't matter. You know, it, it wasn't a tech hub 20 years ago. I think it has great potential to be a tech hub now because it has great people here. Including yourself, of course. Uh, no, no, not necessary. Marketers don't uh, count in that description, I think. Uh, that's a separate category. Um, so let, let's see if there are a couple of final questions from the audience. So we have one more from you, sir. Any, any, any others? Anyone else? Uh, and one at the front. So let, let's take the one from uh, our student first, and uh, then down here at the front table. Go ahead. Okay, that's, that's a great question. So I'm get, while Caitlin's bringing the mic down to the front table, we'll let you answer that one. Yeah, so I, I don't know about the Google versus Mac. I, I haven't followed that closely enough to know. But what we don't look for, what we really don't want, are people who start by saying what is difficult. Uh, you know, they're, you're generally, I'd rather somebody be wrong by saying that they can do something or something can be achieved than somebody that is wrong um, by, by, or somebody who is right by saying it can't be achieved. This is a really big difference. And you'd be surprised how, per, 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 how prevalent that attitude is, that things just cannot be done. Um, as far as the way that we weed out bias, uh, I really believe in mentorship. Uh, in ways that I, th you know, sort of apprenticeship, mentorships in ways that I don't think have, uh, exist as much now as they used to. Um, uh, we work very closely with a community college. We help develop a, a trade school. Um, we were in a, in a sort of underprivileged neighborhood. And we, you know, we, we, were, we believe that everybody is trainable if they have that 
mindset that everything is possible. Um, last question, please. I think we're facing major problems. And we're not ma facing major problems because the rest of the world can't do it, but because we haven't done it for so long that there's going to be delay in, in being able to do it. Um, I think it's been extremely reckless to rely so much on a single company as we've come to rely on TSMC. I think, that it, I think it's a really dangerous situation right now, to be honest. What should we, what should we do about it? I think if we take these these uh, both private investment and investment from things like the new chips act that was passed and build inexpensive small factories that can move that are agile and move quickly we may be able to make up that gap if we if we only build things that take five years to build and cost twenty billion dollars to build i don't think that we'll get there in time so it's it's being able to move quick that by the time you start you break ground to the time you're producing takes one year i think if we have that type of mentality about it, it's, it's a war mentality, but it's not a war in a violent sense mentality, but it's an urgency mentality that we need that we didn't have before. So t TSMC's customers are uh, requiring that it set up plants uh, to a much greater degree outside of Taiwan, specifically I think in Arizona and, ja Taiwan. and Japan to name a few. Um, are those plants going to be viable, do you think? Uh, and what's the time frame to, to your point? I think they could be viable. I think that it, it's, it still takes three to five years, though. So if, if there's a war tomorrow, I think they still have the same problem. All right. So, you know, fascinating uh, conversation. I think you'll all agree uh, from uh, nanotechnology to uh, geopolitical risk. I mean, it's actually very illustrative of what any entrepreneur who's on the cutting edge of science and technology has to deal with these days. You have to be sensitive to the entire uh, global set of circumstances that could be tailwinds or headwinds for you, as well as getting the science right as well. So I want to thank uh, you, Matthew, most sincerely for sparing time uh, to come and uh, share with us and I'm sure all of our students here are thrilled to have had the chance to see you because not many people in the public sphere know the name Nanotronics but I'm sure 10 years from now everybody will know the name Nanotronics and ladies and gentlemen you were here at the front end pre-IPO fireside chat with Matthew Putman. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.